You're listening to the Struck Podcast. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And here on Struck, we talk about everything aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. All right, welcome back. This is the Struck Podcast, episode 25. I'm your co-host, Dan Blewett, and I'm here joined remotely by lightning protection expert, Alan Hall. Alan, how are you? Great, Dan. Hey, uh, just reading the information about that auto uh, aircraft design. Kind of looks like a fish with a propeller on the back. That's a pretty cool thing. New technology, sort of old technology, combination between the two. Super aerodynamic. Yeah, we... We've got some interesting things to cover today. So right off the bat with our some of our news stuff, um, there was a man in a jetpack <laughs> reportedly <laughs> near LA Air- LAX airport. So that's terrifying. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, GoGo has been sold to Intelsat. So some movement in the radome, biz- uh, radome business. Uh, we are going to talk about the auto aviation. Uh, they have a, a bullet-shaped plane, which... Has some really interesting specs. I mean, it can glide up to 125 miles. They said so. The fuel efficiency is they're proposing is tremendous. Um, and lastly, we'll also chat a little bit about uh, potential for a supersonic Air Force One, uh, Hyundai entering the EVTOL market, and some battery advances by Tesla that might make a real big difference also in the electric uh, aviation. So first, let's talk about this jetpack fellow. Uh, <laughs> What, what is your take here? I, I saw this article that they're investigating that there might have been a guy very close to the airport, which is obviously big cause for concern. Um, I mean, how do they regulate this stuff at the airport? Well, you can't fly anything near an airport because an aircraft may run into it. So they're super cautious and pilots are, are very aware of, of peripher- peripheral things around the airport that could and pose a safety risk to the aircraft. So uh, seeing uh, somebody in a jetpack suit or something of the sort probably set off a lot of alarm bells in the cockpit And uh, because uh, sh- he shouldn't be doing that. But I don't think they have found who, who what, when, where this thing is. Like this, this is still sort of a mystery as far as I can tell from the news sources. They haven't identified... Who was doing this? And is it? It was it a real person? Was it a dummy? Was it a drone of some sort? Who knows, right? It could have been a high school kid with, you know, some sort of. Who obviously they're not. The kids aren't really at school right now, looking to you know entertain themselves. Who knows? Uh, but it is a real safety risk. Holy moly! Well, just I mean, we were talking about bird strikes last last week. Yeah. Well, what we don't need to have is human strikes with people just up there. And I mean, that's horrific. So yikes. Yeah. They got to stay, stay away from the airport. Well, so. yeah. And I, the, you know, the Iron Man movies have, uh, in, have a creative influence on a lot of, uh, people who are sort of quasi scientific and have the skill sets to, to make stuff. Right. So in today's world, it's mm-hmm. not very hard to, to buy little jet engines that can propel you, uh, that have more thrust, uh, than your body weight and so they can lift you and and um uh, the guys off of uh mythbusters do you ever see that episode where the, where the one of the mythbusters guys built that iron man suit and was flying around in it that's the first thing that popped up in my head I was like is that a mm-hmm. mythbusters guy who was doing that um but if you remember back in the old james bond movies where they had james bond in that jet pack flying around in part of the movie that that's what also popped to mind is like holy moly are someone jetpacks are a thing it, it is a thing <laughs> that is not difficult to do in today's world you just don't want to do it near an airport that's all man yeah that's a really really bad idea yeah. <laughs> Ugh, get, hit, get hit by a plane come on <laughs> yeah i mean i i think jetpack technology has enough trouble dealing with hitting the ground i mean that seems to be the main hazard like let's not throw extra variables yet the ground is a major threat now we have planes coming at you i mean that's a scary technology yeah but <laughs> yeah so intel sat is has acquired gogo commercial so you're obviously super familiar with both of these companies mm-hmm. uh, being in the radome protection business so what is this uh how does this this transaction strike you so 400 million dollars was the sales price now, Intel sat file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in May, yeah. um, and they're going to finance the transaction using cash on hand and some borrowing. Right. But um, what do you what do you see emerging from this uh, this deal? Probably uh, definitely more stable 
leftover go-go. Uh, the business side of go-go, which is the air to ground side, not air and not aircraft to satellite business. So they are the, the commercial sides, the aircraft to satellite, uh, 2KU, uh, pizza pie shaped antennas with the radium on the back end of the fuselage, uh, design that that's a great product, by the way, uh, that seems to have really, they have really pushed that product pretty hard and have deeply penetrated the marketplace with that product line, uh, and rightly so. But it is, it is, it is KU, so the, 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 the bandwidth of that system is limited versus the KA systems, the newer KA systems that are coming about today. But GoGo's been in some financial flux, and they, it's sort of, um, it's a tough business to be in because you're, you're selling these kits to install an aircraft and then getting some revenue back on the sales of the data. I think that's how it's all set up. Um, so it's sort of hand to mouth. Um, it takes a lot of cash to create that business, and then and then you're trying to recoup it sort of slowly over time. And, and GoGo on that on that side of the business had struggled. In fact, it wasn't probably a year or two ago where they're, they're talking about essentially the same thing, trying to break the company into keep the business the business side, business aircraft side, up and running, and and sell off the commercial side to spacecraft manufacturer or spacecraft business satellite business uh, to them because it's part of their network. That would make sense to me. The business side has always been very profitable for GoGo, so they have a, a, a number of air to ground, and they're the really they're an evolution of other companies. But essentially, they've always had this sort of network of cell towers they've installed antennas on, to uh, for the aircraft to uh, send data up and down to ground stations. So as you fly across the United States, you come across these ground stations, and it, it sent data up and down. So it, it was a sort of a cellular based technology, so to speak. So you put a couple of antennas, you have a transmit and receive antenna on the bottom of the airplanes, and uh, you have decent data rates doing that. There's not a hundred people in a in a Global Express or Gulfstream Five. There's five or six, typically. So you don't have to have a ton of data, and those towers and the air to ground system was sort of the right mix for that marketplace. Plus, you're dealing with uh, a sort of a, a, a class of ownership there in which the cost of that system is sort of irrelevant because the desire to have internet and data and communication, if you're a CEO of, um, you know, like Bloomberg or someone like that, you, you want to have that data. So whatever you're paying for much pretty much doesn't matter to you because in the, in the scheme of, of the wealth of that, or you're like a Zuckerberg or something like that, it doesn't make any difference. Right. So, so, so it's mm -hmm. a much more profitable business market than sort of charging me eight bucks uh, to for if Wi-Fi on Delta or something. That's a different, totally different marketplace. So as airlines have been pushing for cost savings, obviously GoGo gets pushed and GoGo had a couple of issues, technical issues that really set them back, uh, particularly with Delta and that cost them some time and some money. So GoGo has been letting go of people um, in the last couple of months, partly due to COVID, partly due to some other business issues. But that hasn't been good because uh, those the engineers there are, at GoGo are bright, brilliant people. I mean, the ones I've dealt with have been really smart uh, and and doing a fantastic job for the product. And some of them have been let go just because the economic conditions aren't right. Uh, so I hope that now that uh, you know they've transferred ownership to a, a satellite company that some of those engineers get hired back to support that product line because it, it does have a marketplace they have a large market share right now and you'd hate to see it go away that that's it's sort of like global eagle global eagle went through the same it's going through the same thing they filed for bankruptcy um, a couple of months ago global eagle was the uh, row 44 it was the company that installed all the satcoms on southwest airline airplanes so everybody's running. As soon as the airplanes stop flying, the revenue streams from those aircraft stop too. So if if you're relying upon the consumer revenue to pay for all the things you spent money on, all the engineering time and development time, and airplanes aren't flying, you're in trouble. It'd be like if you shut down 80% of the slot machines in Vegas. Like Vegas would be in big trouble, right? You need yeah. people pulling the lever, right? And and they don't have it right now, and so it, it it's it's causing a lot of chaos in the marketplace. What worries me is when we come out of this COVID-19 thing is that all of a sudden we don't have internet service. So I was traveling this last week a little bit. And one of the things I noticed um, for the first time ever, actually, I was having trouble with my uh, Global Eagle Southwest Airlines 
internet connection, like funky things were happening there and it never happened before. I thought, is this a result of them being sort of a financial difficulty trying to reestablish themselves as a company and they have technical issues, they don't have the staff to support it, or is it just a fluke? But, you know, what runs through your mind is like, hey, they're in bankruptcy, they're reorganizing, stuff happens when you're reorganizing and this kind of, um, from the consumer perspective, chaos happens. But it's not good, you know. We've, we've got to get back to people starting to travel again relatively soon. All right, so in our engineering segment, we're gonna chat about, uh, first off, the auto aviation Solera 500L, which their company is calling the most fuel efficient, commercially viable passenger aircraft in the world. Now, if you were to, if you were to go back to elementary school and draw a fish, where you make like the big loop and then you make the tail. <laughs> That's essentially what this aircraft looks like. Um, and so it does look strikingly different. It looks kind of like a blimp. It's got a, you know, a rear pusher propeller. It's got some really long, thin, um, thin wings, but all these things obviously have a very specific purpose. They say it, it extensively utilizes laminar flow over the fuselage wing and tail, yeah. and that it can glide 125 miles at 30,000 feet. Mm. So obviously with all this glide, you know, the ability to glide so far, it's extremely fuel efficient. So Alan, you say this is almost like a rebirth of a previous jet. Is that true? Well, if anybody remembers the Lear fan and the Lear fan was, uh, Bill Lear late in his life. Um, Bill Lear was building an aircraft out in Kansas. I think it was Kansas. It's a composite airplane. And it looked very similar to this. It had a just kind of a fish-shaped fuselage a propeller on the back and not as highly uh, laminar flow wing at the time just because they didn't have the computers to do that stuff. But it had a two engines, uh, PT-6 kind of turboprop engines that were driving, I think it was turboprop engines, that were driving through a transmission, a single propeller on the back. And it, just the era in which that was being developed it had difficulty, the transmission had difficulty. And they were making it out of carbon fiber, which was really new at that point. That's before the, the, the Beach Starship even came out. So the Beach Starship was sort of an outgrowth of the Lear fan. All the engineers that were around the Lear fan kind of jumped over to Beach at the time and to make the, the Starship and then make the, the Premier and the Horizon and everything else after that. Uh, but the aerodynamic design, and it's, it's just been a concept for a while. So it's not like this, the auto aviation is a, necessarily a, a new idea as much as they have now the computational power to do the laminar flow thing and to make it super slippery to be very efficient, which Bueller didn't have during his lifetime. So it, it's sort of a combination of old, old school sort of, uh, uh, basic fundamental design, right? You want a two engines so you can fly and keep the propeller turning, but you want all the aerodynamic efficiency that you can get because you have the computers to go do it. That's what it looks like to me. Um, mm -hmm. So it doesn't look, you know, the thing about, here's the thing about aircraft shape I always find fascinating is there is a little bit of human psychology into the way that they design those aircraft that when you're putting down the amount of money to buy an airplane, some part of that is a cool factor. Mm -hmm. and it looks cool. Piaggio has been in this marketplace for a while. Uh, Piaggio has a very similar shaped aircraft. It's, it's a pusher plane also. And it has a kind of cool factor to it. And it's Italian and it's it's got all these things. So Wait, are you saying this one does have cool factor or does not have I, cool factor? I don't know if this thing has cool factor. Does it look Sometimes it's by uh, paint. Sometimes it's by paint. And so here's the thing that I noticed first off. It's just painted all white, right? Yeah. Right? And if if I'm if I'm a marketing guy or marketing person, it doesn't be a guy. It could be anybody. If I'm a marketing person at uh, a new aircraft company, I want my aircraft to, to be the coolest looking thing that anybody has ever seen. I want this thing to look like a Formula One race car. That's what mm -hmm. I'm that's the look I'm going for. And right now it looks like a, a bloated fish a little bit, which is not yeah. particularly appealing to the eye. It is very efficient. Aerodynamics is very efficient, but they got to find a way to make it look 
cool also. Yeah, like a two tone. And that's what I was just, when you said cool factor, I immediately thought of the Honda Jet. Yeah. Which those are very impressive looking paint, very impressive shaped, yes. but they also have impressive paint jobs too. Yes. Well, you're right. If you if you can, and of course, you know, a lot of these are like, this is going to be more like a business jet mm -hmm. where they say it could be economically almost the same price as a uh, flying on a commercial jet, which is crazy to think about that you could have a similar cost. You know, we'll see. But, uh, you know, if, if you're some rich dude or some rich gal, and you want to buy, and you're going to have like your first, you're going to buy your first plane. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, all right, they're both $15 million or, and I don't know if that's the price. I'm yeah. just throwing a price yeah. out there. I have $15 million to spend and they're both pretty comparable, but uh, I want this to reflect on how important I am and cool I am, like you said. Right. So yeah, I think, I think there's definitely something to be said there. You don't want to be the guy with the dorky. You don't want to have the minivan of, of the airplane world, right? <laughs> No, you definitely that's not. not what you want. No, that's not what you want. Well, so. It's just like a Tesla, right? A Tesla car is a car. You know, it's got four wheels. It's got the windshield. It's got the steering wheel. It's got the whole thing. But, you know, they've trimmed all the door handles down. They've, it doesn't have an antenna on it. It's got, it's aerodynamically. It's got all these little funky little, very, uh, a lot of finesse and marketing decisions were made about the design mm -hmm. and look of that car and the colors they have chosen, by the way, to make it look cool and inviting because the car costs twice what a normal piston gasoline powered car would cost. So you got to make it worth their while a little bit. And that's that's part of the way they do it. Yeah. And they really departed. I mean, Tesla from the just horrifically ugly, you know, <laughs> um, what is it? The, the Honda. Uh, what was it? I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but I mean, some of the early electric cars are just so bad looking, you know, the, the Prius, the Toyota Prius mm -hmm. this is yeah. like the ugliest car of all time. I mean, come on. Like why? Just because it was electric, we had to shape it like that. Well, I, I think you know, again, and, and the Prius was, was an aerodynamically shaped vehicle to keep the fuel efficiency high, just like the auto aviation aircraft yeah. is right. But you have to make, and I think that was one of Toyota's issues and that they never could make it cool they made it environmentally cool it was a sort of a status symbol thing yeah. which is a way to market it sure uh, but aircraft are different than that because they're not seen as green <laughs> aircraft are never really seen as green so you're in a different sort of marketplace where the cool factor and this is where bill lear learjet had this figured out years ago which is it's got to look cool it's got to be around uh influencers and be adapt adopted and sort of that and that's Gulfstream's done the same thing and the bombardier global express people have done the same thing this is where they're trying to make the aircraft part of lifestyle and that part of aircraft sales is sometimes overlooked particularly by the engineers who you know are not going to be able to ever buy one of these things in a lifetime so the engineers just want to make it work right but the, the the marketing groups want to sell them and those are two different animals that doesn't always meet so whenever I see a, a prototype aircraft that doesn't have a cool paint job on it i think oh you just missed a really great opportunity to to mm -hmm. put yourself out front yeah yeah well, speaking of super cool, uh, the U.S. Air Force has issued contracts for a supersonic Air Force One. So, Exonic, Exosonic, and Hermaeus, uh, which are, I guess, like not super well known, like not household names. They're not Boeing, right? They're not right, Airbus. Right. Uh, they're not Lockheed Martin. Mm -hmm. So, um, but they're awarded separate contracts by the Air Force uh, to potentially develop this supersonic plane. What is, uh, you know, a Mach 1.8 twin jet is kind of like the idea, mm -hmm. but is this viable? I mean, does this seem like crazy? I mean, Not is this crazy. thing that's going to happen in 10, 20 years? It, how, how, how far out of the distance is it? Probably 20. Uh, Yikes. Well, it's really, it's really far. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, sorry, yeah. sorry, Donald. You won't be in this plane. No, sorry. Definitely not. Uh, no. Just because. Well, think about it. I mean, we've been building aircraft that have, that have passed the Mach 1 threshold for a long time now. So that's not new technology. So and there's a couple like Boom and Arion and a couple others are going to build a supersonic business aircraft. That's that's in the works. I and mean, they're building prototypes right now. So that, that that's happening. I, I think the Air Force One's a different animal in that it's got to have a ton of communications equipment. It's got to have ability to hold a lot of people because there's always press, you know, there's, there's press as part of the 
president's job is communication, right? So there's always press mm-hmm. and staff and things and and Air Force personnel and safety personnel on it. And it has to be super, super safe. This The thing about a 747, which the has been used for most of my, well, a long time now, since the 70s, I think, as the, well, since, no, since Reagan, since Reagan, which had been the 80s, uh, is when I think the 747 Air Force One popped out. Was it was just a four-engine aircraft, and it's specially designed to fly at super high altitudes, and has all this anti-missile technology, has all this satellite communication technology on it. And I don't know how you're going to do that on a supersonic aircraft, because they don't tend to be big. Like, where does all the stuff come in, and how do you make it go supersonic without having all these defensive mechanisms and um, communications equipment and ability to, you know, there's there's some fundamental parts of this which we'll have to try to figure out, which why I say it's going to be a 20-year event, because they will not, the Air Force will not let the president get anywhere near this thing until they are guaranteed that this has no chance of coming out of the air, ever, mm-hmm. ever. And the Air Force has never had an Air Force One accident, hasn't it, right? Uh, and it's just because that aircraft is maintained at such a high level, and there's two of them, but those aircraft are maintained at such a high level all the time. A supersonic aircraft, you know, the Air Force deals with those air, supersonic aircraft all the time, all the fighter jets are. But, you know, there's accidents in those aircraft all the time. 747s don't come out of the air too often. So there's, there's that reliability factor, I think, that has to be built into any sort of supersonic Air Force One. I get the concept where the president's not going to be tied up um, on an aircraft for a six hour flight, which you can do in one. There's a lot of upside on that if you're the president, because your time is extremely valuable. But I, I, I just don't see it. I mean, it's cool. It's a great, cool idea. And maybe they'll develop some technologies to make all this happen. But there's a lot more than just the aircraft here. A lot more. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. I mean, you talk about the difficulties of certification just in general. And now you're saying, this has got to be president certified, which is like a whole nother thing. So that's, level. that's an interesting thought. Yeah, I didn't think about that. But for sure, there's going to be a lot more hoops and bells and whistles they'll have to have installed to, to make that work. Yes. Oh, yes. To say, to say the least. Yes. Yeah. All right. So let's jump into our electric tech segment. Uh, we've got some interesting EVTOL news. So Alan Hyundai... Uh, they're joining. <laughs> we needed more people. You know, we just didn't have enough already trying to <laughs> capture the EVTOL market. Um, and this is a really cool looking, I think it's really cool. It looks very futuristic. Uh, they're partnering with uh, Uber Elevate to help develop these air taxis. So Hyundai's partnering with them. Mm-hmm. And uh, their, their SA1 will potentially cruise at 180 miles per hour between one to 2000 feet of elevation with a range of about 60 miles. Um, this thing, and I only see this one photo, it looks like it has propellers on top and bottom of these big extensions, like off the two kind of like main wings. Yep. I mean, we've talked about <laughs> safety of what, if what happens if one of these propeller blades breaks off. Yeah. And I'm looking at how do you get in this plane without having your head hit the rotor? Yeah. Like it, I don't know. That seems that seems awfully close to I, where the people go. Again, where the, again yeah. it's that cool factor. There, a lot of this marketing of the EVTOL marketplace is based on coolness. And they're they're smart, and it, particularly when they have automotive companies involved because they understand what the consumer market looks like all the time because they're constantly in it. And they, and they know they mm-hmm. have, they're surveying people all the time. They're watching trends. They're watching particularly color trends, shape trends, all that stuff. And the the car market is an output of what every, all the other marketplaces that we're in. And trying, I always feel a lot of times, particularly the United States automakers, are always sort of falling behind on trends. They're watching. They're watching. So the the EVTOL EVTOL market has really cool looking stuff on computer generated and they paint yep. and they paint their prototypes to look cool like a final design which is mm-hmm. smart there's some marketing people involved in that really really smart but I think we need to get past the is it shiny and look cool to I'm um, putting a human being in it and if something were to go wrong do people walk away from it 
that's the harder question to answer, and which is going to take a lot more engineering time to figure out. So you, what you don't want to get too deep into is having a marketing to pers- marketing team define the final configuration, um, and then you can't certify it. You can't make it work. So have you mm-hmm. ever, ever seen the movie Tucker about um, building the car, building the, 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 the helicopter engine car in the rear and and uh, back in the after World War II, so it was like late 40s, early 50s. So that sort of thing happened to them where they had this, he was, he, he, Tucker was selling the picture of a car and he sold a lot of them quite actually. He sold a lot of cars based on a photo or an image, a drawing of this thing. Yeah. And then when the engineers got involved, like, hey, we can't do that. Hey, you know, we got an air-cooled engine. We need to have all the stuff, right? So we have, you have to have, you have to make it into a product at some point. And when you sell an image, it's hard, and you get people locked into that. It's hard to ch- for engineers to change that. Yeah, it's really difficult. It's a really yeah. You don't want to claw claw back that here. Here, here's what this beautiful electric is going to be. And then you deliver and you're like, oh, it's actually way different looking and not nearly as aesthetically appealing and not what you thought it was. Yeah, right. that's, <laughs> so then you got to you have to fit the fit the engineering into this box that maybe just may not fit. May not fit, sense. right? How, how much yeah. have you noticed lately that they've all gone away? So that all the ducted fans designs have gone away, right? So they used to have this mm-hmm. long tube around the blades all the yeah. time. That's gone away because it don't work. You know, the aerodynamics don't work on that. In particular, flight configurations, you tilt those things, you don't have the aerodynamics you want to fly it. So and it may work on a small little plastic drone in my backyard, but it sure isn't going to work on a, you know, a 5,000-pound vehicle. Not happening. Mm-hmm. So it, it's when you, when we see these things, especially when you have automotive companies get involved, you know, you hope that they bring along sort of the, yeah, it's got to look cool, but yeah, it also has to work part because they've gone through that a lot. And mm-hmm. the aircraft companies don't always do that. That's why there's so many aircraft companies I think it fail, is that they sold it a thing, an image, an idea, a concept, but the reality is you can't make that work. That's where, you know, we, that's where companies get made or, or, or fail. A lot of companies right there. I know when I worked on the the Beach Premier, right? So the Beach Premier jet was, in my opinion, a really cool looking thing. Right, but it got people got sold a certain certain look to it, and when it was finally produced, um, just because of the way that it was configured and the way that we wanted to manufacture it, it had long landing gear. Like it, the aircraft stood up high because it, the mm-hmm. the wing was actually bolted to the bottom of a of a real cylinder fuselage. So the, the, usually the wing actually penetrates the cylinder of the fuselage. In this case, it didn't. It actually is bolted onto the bottom. So it kind of got this guppy guppy look to it. And it looks odd on the ground. So they had a hard time, I think, marketing the thing because it looks cool in the air. It was fast. Uh, And it did, performance-wise, pretty much essentially what it was sold to. But the the comments on the internet were, oh, it looks looks guppy-ish. It looks slow. It doesn't have... But in flight, it's awesome. Uh, Looks looks have a lot to do with the aircraft market because it's just the marketplace you're in. It really is. Yeah, and it's a high dollar thing. Like, like, like we said, it's got to look, it's got to look the part, right? Yes. I mean, yeah. Which is what Honda's <laughs> done, right? Honda has totally done that with the Honda Jet. Yeah. They start out with a cool design, but they also knew that it would work, and they stuck to it. So they they spent a lot of time making those two things, the coolness and the functionality, work together. They spent many many years doing that. Now, of course, you know. It's always the dog that's not barking. You're always wondering, where's the dog that's not barking? Who's the dog that's not barking in EVTOL? Honda. <laughs> Honda isn't barking right yeah, yet. where are they? Where are they, right? Because they're making a really cool aircraft. It has market appeal. It, it They have decent sales on the thing already, so they know what they're doing. And they have you know the automotive uh, drive behind them to go do a next stage and they have not announced anything in the evtol market and i really wonder if there's something cooking down in north carolina on an evtol for honda because it would make sense in part of the urban mobility automotive growth out automotive they've already been in the aircraft business they already know what they're doing there they have all the engineers to certify stuff they have a great electrical engineering department so 
they could totally go do an, an VTOL and I think be successful in it, but they have not made any noise in that marketplace. And that's the one to watch for. Hmm. Well, I mean, you, you go back to how do you convince people of anything? And there's, I mean, so much research about how people don't just respond to facts. So facts, obviously, in this case, are like, <laughs> here's the speed of it, the aerodynamics, here's the range, like here are all yeah. the tech specs, right? But when you see something, like you see that beautiful Honda Jet and you're like, oh, I can see myself in that. Yeah. And you start, you have like an emotional attachment. It's something that's like a beautiful sports car, you know, mm -hmm. beautiful airplane. Yep. And then like, that's fine. But like this one, which you don't feel that way about, has like better specs. It's faster. You're like, no, nah, this one makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. So yeah, I think you're right that there's still... These are still humans buying these vehicles and you can't just sell them a spec sheet. No, so. no, not today. No, definitely not, not at all. No. So last thing on our list today, Tesla, they say uh, in their battery research, uh, they're getting closer to a potential breakthrough that could really affect uh, av aviation. So what's your take? It sounds like the, e I mean, obviously this is going to be p big news for the EVTOL market. Um, they have an anode free lithium metal battery that Tesla's uh, research team in Canada is, they say they're getting to this approximately 360 watt hour per kilogram energy density wow. that they need to potentially power these aircraft a lot better. So um, how big of a, a deal is this? Well, have you bought Tesla stock lately, Dan? Because you probably should. <laughs> <laughs> That's how big of a deal it's going to be. Uh, and now, and Tesla stock, in my opinion, is, is extremely overvalued. And, and Elon Musk will tell you that today. Like, it doesn't make any sense. But, but there's, well, he does that all the time anyway. Yeah, yeah it doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, it's a cool factor, and there's a lot of cash in the marketplace because the economy's down. So things that look like that are, are positively moving forward get a lot of cash dump into them. And Tesla has been that now. There's been a lot of talk for several months about Tesla announcing a bat new battery technology, and it seems like it gotten delayed a little bit and delayed a little bit. Now, the latest I heard is going to be the middle to end of September is when they're going to make a formal announcement. At least Musk has been tweeting about it a little bit. I think that will happen. And if the energy, essentially energy, energy density of the batteries makes some significant breakthrough, even a moderate breakthrough, would, would be a really big deal on all kinds of battery technology things. So, you know, Musk has got so many things cooking at one time, Tesla and SpaceX, uh, and it's not just Musk, right? I mean, there's, there's thousands of engineers and tens mm -hmm. of thousands of employees at those companies that are, that are making uh, magical things happen right now. But, you know, Musk is really pushing towards really a different looking society of some sort. It, it seems to be where he's going with the Mars, people living on Mars and trying to get people to travel to Mars. I think that is a possibility still. It's still in the realm of possibility. But he's also making inroads in significant battery technology uh, that will have a real driving change into the way the American, European, Asian economies work. And don't think otherwise, because if some of these things even come partly true, there's going to be a big shift. And if we can drive the cost of battery down and get the density, energy density up, uh, you or I will, will have a different, our, our kids will have a different life than what we had. And I do think uh, the thing about Musk is that, and just having seen a little bit closer over the last couple of weeks, I do think that there is a... Uh, kind of like Google had for a while and Facebook had for a while, there's sort of this gravitational effect on engineering talent that's, that's happening with him where it's like the top destination for engineering graduates uh, just because I think they're just visible and they, they pay decent salaries and they're working on cool stuff. But the fallout of that is that you have a lot of smart people working pretty hard and seem, and seem to have sort of this greater goal going on so they're willing to put in time on it to push the technology and musk doesn't seem to care where the technology is being developed at like you said this is up in canada right so mm -hmm. he doesn't care if there is an idea that holds merit and i think they've he's spread out trying different things and, and trying to focus where the activity really is happening and then put some energy into it and try to get it over the finish line his ability to 
create buzz. It's great because he's got successful things that are working. And it sort of gets us this, this little cyclical thing where engineering talent's going to him. There's market forces driving it. There's a lot of cash flow so he can do things that other corporations could never do. And hopefully it'll get us over this battery, battery limitation. It's been going on for 100 plus years. It'll be a huge uh, breakthrough that, and, and I know it's hard to think about this, but it'll it'll change lives. It really will. I mean, the, the having seen the Tesla factory recently, and the number of cars pumping out of that place, you're like, holy moly, they are making a lot of cars. This is not just for the elite anymore. You see a lot of cars uh, driven by people who who you know five years ago probably wouldn't thought about it. So there is a changing force in the marketplace. And this battery technology is going to drive it forward in automotive and in aviation, no doubt. All right. Well, that's it for today's episode of Struck. We covered a lot of really good topics today. Uh, if you're new to the show, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and check us out on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, wherever you listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out our website at weatherguardaero.com. That's A-E-R-O.com we have more articles, videos, all of our podcasts, tons of help docs. So if you're an engineer and you need help on your radar design or your lightning protection systems, definitely check out our website or reach out to us again at weatherguardarrow.com. Thanks again. And we'll see you here on the next show.